So Leanne, it's welcome to, to the stage. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning and also a big hello to everybody online. Now, you need to help me out this morning because those of you that know me well know I like to move around a lot. Yeah, so if you see me getting dangerously close, Jane is going to be like a pantomime, shout out, don't, stop, just whatever, help me. You don't want to see me in that water, or maybe you do, but I don't. It would not, it would not be good. Wow, well, what a privilege to be speaking today, as Pastor Dave just said, part six on our series, An Invitation to Discipleship. You can check out the five parts we've already journeyed online. It has been amazing, hasn't it, church? Deeply encouraging, yet deeply challenging. So we've really been looking at this simple idea that to follow Jesus means to become an apprenticeship, an apprentice of Jesus. An apprentice is someone that follows their master. They do as their master did. They speak as their master did. And we've just been looking at this idea. Thanks, Tammy. You're going to see it up here. To be an apprentice to Jesus is to order your life around three goals. Say it with me. Number one, to be with Jesus. Number two, to become like Jesus. And number three, to do as he did. And that is simply where we've been going these last few weeks. And last week, Pastor Dave um, opened up to us that actually Holy Spirit wants to spiritually form us. We don't just wake up one day like Jesus, but we go on a journey. And we learned last week that this can happen through a few different ways. That next slide, you'll see this triangle up here, the next one, which can help us. The way that we are spiritually transformed is through teaching. It's through practice, it's through community, and it's through Holy Spirit. Yeah, there may be some other ways, but just for this series, we're really honing in on those four areas. How are you spiritually formed? Through teaching, practice, community, and Holy Spirit. So today, in just these few moments, my job is to try and help us explain and understand a little bit more about these things called practices. Turn to your neighbor and say, practices. Turn to your other neighbor and say, do you know what they are? Jesus had a lot to say about practices. And again, last week, we're just going to jump in again. We looked at this verse, Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, says this. And these are Jesus' words to the crowds. He said this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into... One more time, a little bit louder. Puts them into... It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into... Does not put them into... is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And Jesus leaves the stage. Jesus leaves the spot. He's given all this amazing teaching, which we call Sermon on the Mount. We'll talk about that another day. And Jesus basically says, you've now got to, you've got to what? Put it into, put it into, is it enough just to hear it? Are you sure? What have you got to do with it? You've got to put it into. And that is exactly where we are going today. Someone once said this. You're going to see it on your screen. The life of the Christian faith is the practice of many practices. Wow. The life of the Christian faith is the practice of many practices. You see, saying yes. To Jesus is the start of a lifelong journey of training yourself to follow Jesus. And listen, I 
am so happy that I am getting to share this message today, especially to you guys, Tevin, Chisholm AJ, Vanessa, Dawn, because you're right at the starting blocks of the journey. Now, the invitation to you, and it continues to be to all of us at one point that said yes to Jesus, is to train yourself in the way of following Jesus. You see, we've touched on this a few weeks ago, and I'm going to keep banging the same drum, what Richard Foster teaches us in the spiritual disciplines. We don't try to follow Jesus. We train ourselves to follow Jesus. We can't say, well, I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm trying to do something. No, 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 no. Because you try and you'll come to the end of trying really, really quick. You have to train yourself to follow Jesus. Imagine an athlete that's getting ready for a race. They don't say, I'm trying to get ready for the race. No, they train. They have their kit ready. They have their training programs ready. They maybe have reminders on their phone. They have a schedule mapped out. They have goals and targets. Why? Because they're training to win that race. And as followers of Jesus, it's exactly the same, guys. From this day on, you're not trying to follow Jesus. You've got to order every area of your life to train to follow Jesus. You see, we got to train our bodies. we got to train our minds. we got to train our spirits to follow Jesus. You see, before we came to Christ, you and me, we did whatever we pleased. Whatever our flesh wants to do, whatever makes us happy, Whatever feels right in the moment, just like the world tells us, we do whatever, we do whatever. But when we give our lives to Jesus, when you go through these waters of baptism, you, you're under new ownership. You've got a new boss. You can't just do what you want to do anymore. We've got to train our lives to follow our boss, to follow our king, to follow Jesus. You see, some people call these practices, this training to follow Jesus, spiritual disciplines. Some call it rhythms of grace. Someone calls it altars of availability. I quite like that one. But today, we're simply calling it the practices. You see, what you practice, what you repeatedly do, shapes your love and likings. Do you know today that you are a result of the accumulative things that you do on a daily and a weekly basis? You're a result of your habits. You're a result of your practices. Whether that's good, whether you're like, it's a good result today, or whether you're like, I'm not too happy with the result at the moment, or whether you're somewhere in the middle. You and me, we're a result of our practices, a result of what you do. You see, Charles Duhigg, in a book called The Power of Habit, says this, the things we do, do something to us. The things we do, do something to us. For example, if you practice stinking thinking, which is telling yourself how awful you are, how rubbish you are, that everyone else is better, that you've made a mess up again, if you practice that stinking thinking, you'll become a result of it. But if you're the sort of person that practices gratitude, wow, I'm going to be grateful today that I've got some clean clothes to put on, I've got a job to go to, I've got a car to switch an engine on, I've got £10 in my bank account. It might be more than someone else. You practice gratitude, you become a grateful person, the type of person that is grateful. And just like with Jesus, what you do, these spiritual practices, set you on a path 
where you can come closer to God. The practices aren't the path. The practices are the path. They're not the destination. Why do we train ourselves to follow Christ? Why do we do these practices? It's simply to get closer and closer to Jesus. To know him more and more. Maybe you're here today and you feel far away from Jesus. That's okay. That's your reality. And we have to call that out. I feel far away, Leanne. Well, the good news is that this message is for you. Because as you train yourself in these practices, I tell you what will happen. You will get closer to Jesus. It may not happen on day one. You may still be struggling on day two. You may still be struggling on week two. But you keep practicing You keep training yourself in these practices and you will get closer to Jesus. It will happen. I'll give you your money back if it doesn't. It will happen. So, we have work to do. God works and you work. God has a part to play in your spiritual transformation and you have a part to play. St. Augustine from the 4th century said this, without God we cannot and without us God will not. You see, maybe for some of us we can think, well, I'm, I'm giving my life to Christ, I'm going through the waters of baptism. Well, I'm done now. Uh, No, no, I'm not done. I'm going to come to church two hours a week on a Sunday. Occasionally, I might read my Bible if I can remember where I put it the last time I picked it up. Occasionally, when I'm in trouble, I will ask God to help me. Help! And I'll forget to say thank you when the answer comes through. But no, I want to tell you something. That every day, you have work to do in growing to become more like Jesus. God's got his work that he's going to do in your life, but he says, Leanne, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do so you can develop and you can grow? We had a little laugh a few weeks ago when I said this statement. There are no accidental saints. Not one. I've never met anyone that went to bed, remember we said feeling like Judas and woke up like Jesus. It just happened. No, there's no accidental saints. We have to work at this with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul knew this, the Apostle Paul, so well in his book. Put that verse up for us, Tammy, 1 Corinthians 9. 25 to 27, the Apostle Paul said this to the church at Corinth, which knew all about athletics well. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. And Paul there, he's likening your Christian journey and mine to training like an athlete. There's work to be done. There's training to be put in. We don't want to waste our time with no purpose, beating the air, taking no forward progression. But there's work to be done just like an athlete. And these practices that we're going to dive into just now, they help you and me to order our life, to curate our life in the direction of Jesus. Because if we're really honest, here's the scary thing. If you and me don't get intentional about training our lives to follow Jesus, 
your flesh will win every time. It's just how we're wired. Because, Isabella, Joanna, come and help me. Because this is what, again, the Apostle Paul says. Round of applause for these two fine ladies. Okay, Isabella, go stand at the bottom there, need you have a tangled rope there. Awful. Sonny, help me out. Thank you. So one end to this lady and one end to Isabella. Come over here, sweetie. The Apostle Paul says this. Let's read it. 1 Peter 2 verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. I want to paint this in a picture because I want us to get this church. You see, Paul is saying that there's a war going on in your soul. There's a war that's been happening and it's going to continue in your soul. For all of us, there's a war. And the war simply is this. Who's going to win? Is it going to be your flesh? Hello, flesh. Your flesh today. Flesh is us without Jesus. It's a carnal. It's a sinful nature. And I don't care how long you've been following Jesus. Hello, flesh. It's still alive and active. Your flesh is very, very real. And there's a war. But here's the thing. Down here, when we come to know Jesus... Hello, new creation. This is new creation. But the apostle Paul is saying, now, come on, girls, I want you to do tug of war, okay? So you've got to pull that way, and you've got to pull that way. They need cheering on, everyone. Come on, cheer over here for Flash. Pull, Flash. Pull, Flash. Cheer over here for new creation. Pull, new creation. Pull, new creation. Come on, keep pulling. Keep cheering them. Keep cheering them. Come on. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Flash on new creation. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? <laughs> Keep pulling. Brilliant. <sighs> Woo! And time out. You can come back. You can come back. Keep holding that rope. Don't start flash. Keep holding. See, and Paul is saying, there's a war against your soul. And Jesus knows this. He was human. Jesus was flesh. So he knows your weaknesses so well. And when we orient our life, when we train ourselves in these practices, the new creation is getting stronger. Start pulling new creation. The new creation is getting stronger. It's getting stronger. The flesh is getting weaker. The flesh, it's still there, but it's getting weaker. It's getting weaker. Now start new creation. But when we get lazy and we think, I don't need to do nothing but rock up to church on a Sunday, the flesh is getting stronger. Pull flesh, pull flesh. The flesh is getting stronger. And there's a war. There's a war going on. Right now, you will be knowing what you're warring with. Some of us were stuck in addictions. Some of us were stuck in stinking thinking. Some of us were warring with things that are just, we're putting our hope on attachments and things around us. There's a war going on. But Spirit of God, Jesus is like, train yourself to follow me. So your new creation will win the war. Your new creation will win the war. Round of applause for these ladies. Absolutely fantastic. See, you never know what you're going to do when you come to Live Community Church. It could be like fighting with ropes. It could be anything. So, real quick, the good news is that Jesus modelled a set of core practices that he invites you and me to embed into the fabric of of our life. Some of these practices, let's have that, the other one, Tammy, we've got the four 
quads, brilliant. Some of these practices you will do alone. Everyone say alone. Number one. Some of these practices you will do in community. Say community. Beautiful. Some of these practices will be practices of abstinence. Can you say that word? Abstinence. That means stopping. That means drawing away from something. And fourthly, some of these practices will be engagement. Say engagement. Fantastic. That's just a headline. We'll go into that more in the weeks to come. But all of these practices will be marked with joy. They'll be marked with joy. Because we can think, oh man, this sounds so dull, boring, serious. I've just got to get through it and shut my eyes in case Pastor Leanne asks me, what other practices have you been practicing? But no, I want to tell you that God is the God of joy. He's the God of life. He's the God of freedom. And when we start walking in the way of Jesus, we train ourselves in following Jesus. We start living out these practices. You will be filled with such a joy. Such a joy. It will be unbelievable. We had three days of prayer and fasting last week. Yeah, I was fasting. I've been training over different months. Because I felt challenged. I need to train myself more in fasting. Yeah, I felt miserable on day one. Oh my word, the headaches. Miserable, miserable. But then as you start pressing in, by the end of the fast, I felt joyful. God had done something in my life. The practices will bring joy. Richard Foster says, the keynote of practices is joy. It's joy, because we don't serve a miserable God. We serve a joy-filled, wonderful, fun, full of surprise, full of beauty. That is what you will start to feel and journey with the practices. So what are they? Real quick, I'm just going to mention nine today. There's more, but there's nine, which we see Jesus model. So go check these out throughout the four Gospels. The first one there is Sabbath. Wow. Rest. Nothing good happens when you're shattered. Even God rested on day seven. Not because he needed it, because he knew you needed it. And he was showing us the pattern from the beginning. Sabbath. It's a practice to rest. And in a 24-7, always on, never finished, always go world, what on earth does that look like? Most of us haven't got a clue what Shabbat, what Sabbath looks like. But I believe it can change. That we can start getting on a journey of practicing Sabbath, practicing rest, delight, worship, time with people we love, time by ourselves with God, Sabbath. The second one is prayer. Wow. We can't do nothing without praying. It's a practice. You may say, Leanne, I know how to pray. I've prayed for many years and that's brilliant. But can I say that prayer's like an ocean? There's so much more deeper you can go. And the deeper you go, the more you'll see. And the deeper you go, you'll, you'll, you'll experience stuff. I've never been there. I've never seen that. I've never felt God talk to me like that. Prayer is beautiful. And wherever we are, whether we pray two words or whether we recount ourselves as an amazing intercessor or somewhere in the middle, there's more. There's more. There's more. Praying alone. Praying in community, absolutely wonderful. Then we've got fasting. Wow, this is one of the most overlooked practices in our Western world. Because we don't get it. We think everything about our spiritual formation comes through our mind. But when you fast, spiritual formation is happening through your tummy. Yeah, because we're telling our spirit, be quiet. I'm training you. For those of us with, uh, um, we're stuck in addictions. We're stuck in bodily functions, which we know are not good. Can I 
recommend wholeheartedly start fasting. Because when you fast, you're starting to train and take control over your flesh. No flesh. I'm not giving you in. No flesh. I've made an agreement. I'm seeking my God. And you will start seeing things shift and break in your life when you fast food. I'm not talking fast in your phone. Do that if you want. This is food. This is hunger pains. Spiritual formation will happen. We can fast alone. We can fast in community to cheer one another on. Jesus knew how to feast and he knew how to fast. There's seasons to do both. Fasting. Fourthly, solitude. Henry Nowen, who's a great writer on spiritual formation, said this. Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to lead a spiritual life. Wow. When was the last time you just got by yourself? Just you and Jesus. It's so important. And Jesus did it all the time. He withdrew and then he came back. He engaged. Then he withdrew. Then he engaged. And that is our model. Scripture. No, sorry. Generosity. Amazing. When we give, when we're generous. Scripture, the word of God. We spoke tons about that last week. Such an important practice. Community. Turn to the person next to you and say, community. It's what we're doing right now. Wow. Wow. We're not called to follow Jesus alone. This isn't about our individualism. We're called. This is a practice. Some of us love this. We can't wait to be in community. Other of us were like, yeah, it's not too bad, but I quite like getting home by myself at the end of it. Because we all have different wirings, and that's good. But we need community. We need to be together at service. Wow. The privilege of serving is a practice. Because sometimes we want to serve and other times, it is a chore. But we train ourselves in the way of service. The night before Jesus' execution, what was he found doing? On the floor, praying, excellent. And also on the floor with a towel, washing the sand and muck off the disciples' feet. Wow. What an example. And finally, witnessing. Where we go tell someone, hey, this is the difference Jesus has made. Can I pray with you? Can I give you a word of encouragement? We just share Jesus. So these are nine incredible practices, which today is just a whistle-stop tour. We're going to be looking at these more in the weeks and months to come, really putting legs on these and understanding how they can happen. But in closing, we're training. We're not trying to follow Jesus. Baptismal candidates, if you remember nothing from this day on, ask yourself, how can I train in every area of my life to follow Jesus? Little by little, step by step, increment by increment, to follow after him. Just a question on the screen as I bring this to land. Thanks, Tanny. Maybe, why not take a photo of this? Maybe have it somewhere at home through the week that you can just look back and you can remind yourself of this. Number one, what's one small step you can take this week in practicing the practices? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Just get one thing, one practice. Maybe there's something especially that's jumped out in these last few moments. How can you take one small step to practice that practice in the next seven days? And number two, is there something you need to stop doing? Is there something you need to start doing? This is a great question to, to just sit with Jesus with regular. Jesus, what do I need to start doing? And what do I need to stop doing? And sometimes it's just little tweaks, little tweaks. But again, 
as we take one step, one step, one step, you will get closer to Jesus. And I said it earlier, joy is the keynote of all disciplines. You're going to be filled with joy, Christ follower. You're going to be filled with joy, curious person of the Christian faith, as you delve and you practice these practices. So I'm going to pray, and I just pray that God blesses you, that he lights a fire in your heart. Let's put those practices back up, Tammy. I'm going to invite you just to stand with me in this moment as we pray. Lord Jesus, keep your eyes open, everyone, and just look at those practices there as we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've set the model, that you are the template, and we want to do as Jesus did. So we need to live like Jesus lived. Holy Spirit, would you stir us? Would you highlight to us? Would you both encourage and challenge even as we look at these practices, show your people, every one of us, what we need to start doing and stop doing so that we can train ourselves in the way of Christ. Thank you that your spirit is with us to give us strength and to give us boldness. And we say thank you, Jesus, that you are here. And especially for our baptismal candidates, may they train themselves to follow you to put into practice the words of our Lord Jesus, that we may all build our house on the rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a huge round of applause, shall we?